Great, so welcome everyone. My name is Nora. I'm a fifth year medical student. Um, is the view all right right now? Yeah, I think so. Perfect. So today we're going to do a talk on hematology and infectious diseases. I'm going to do the hematology section and then Martha will be doing the infectious diseases section. If at any point you have any questions, please just let us know. Uh, interrupt at any point, don't worry at all. Uh, and um, I think you can also send messages on, this, uh, on the chat. All right, so when we talk about uh, anemias, we're talking about the de uh, decreased oxygen capacity of the blood. And that is normally because there is low hemoglobin content, but there's also other causes like um, low red blood cell production. But generally, um, it's because the blood is not carrying as much as oxygen as um, it should do. And that's co that causes common symptoms that we can see here. So fatigue, muscle weakness. So all anemias will cause the same symptoms. However, they are classified into three main types, microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic, because of the underlying pathology. So we're going to start with the microcytic anemias first. So as um, red blood cells mature, they become smaller and smaller, and also they incorporate hemoglobin. And until they incorporate hemoglobin, they won't, be bec they won't become um, mature red blood cells. So what happens in um, microcytic anemias is that hemoglobin is defective in some way and so the red blood cells will continue to become smaller and smaller and smaller until hemoglobin is incorporated in some way that's why it's uh, the red blood cells are smaller than normal so when we talk about uh, microcytic anemias really we're talking about some defect in hemoglobin so hemoglobin is made up of uh, three components globin um, as you can see from this uh, diagram here, globin, which is sort of the protein scaffold. Then you have heme, which is protoporphin, and then iron. So if we go through the acronym TAILS, we can sort of see where is um, hemoglobin defective. So first of all, thalassemias are caused because hemoglobin, the globin, sorry, the proteins are defective in some way. Um, there's two types of thalassemias, minor and major. Um, well, it's a bit more complex. There's also alpha thalassemia, beta thalassemia, because um, the mutations can be in the alpha chain of the globin or in the beta chain of the globin. But we can sort of broadly classify them into minor and major thalassemias. Minor thalassemias are if there is a defect in the globin protein, um, which means that it's still synthesized, but it's not working as well. Whereas major thalassemias is if there is no globin protein produced. So that will cause more severe symptoms. So the mutation is very severe, so no globin is produced. Minor thalassemia will present very similarly to um, microcytic, no, sorry, to iron deficiency anemia. So the way that we differentiate between iron deficiency and thalassemia is by calculating the Mentzer index. It's this scientist called Mentzer who uh, formulated like a uh, calculation to differentiate between iron deficiency and thalassemia. It's not that um, important for you to know, but just know that uh, if the Mentzer index is less than 13, then it's a uh, minor thalassemia, whereas if it's more than 13, then it's iron deficiency anemia. Um, usually uh, minor thalassemias don't have to be treated. Major thalassemias, however, present very differently. Normally, the patients will ha have failure to thrive. Um, they'll be jaundiced because the defective red blood cells will be uh, broken down. Um, they'll also have skull bussing because there won't be um, good red blood cells produced. So the body tries to compensate by producing even more red blood cells. And so there will be um, the bone marrow will be working very hard and that causes the bones to appear thicker. That's why there's um, skull, the skull appears thicker as well. And the treatment for major thalassemia is transfusion, blood transfusion. Then in um, second, the other way that hemoglobin can be defective is in um, chronic disease and iron deficiency. This is quite similar. In chronic disease, the iron levels will be low because of some complex thing I won't go into uh, right now. Um, but also you have, can have iron deficiency because you're not consuming enough iron, for example, or um, you're not absorbing iron because you have Crohn's disease, for example. Um, in iron deficiency anemia, 
uh, you treat it by giving fer ferrous sulfate orally. Uh, that's the first line. Uh, something important I think you should know is that it causes black stools and GI upset. And then severe anemia, uh, iron deficiency anemia is given by IV iron or blood transfusion. Something important to note as well is if your patient is having malabsorption, it's not going to be sufficient to give PO ferrous sulfate because if they have Crohn's, for example, they're not going to absorb that PO, the oral form of iron. So it might be more beneficial for them to give them iron IV. Um, the last way that hemoglobin can be defective is um, if the porphyrin, which is this thing here that holds the iron in its place, this binds iron, uh, it's called protoporphyrin. If that is defective, then you get sideroblastic anemia. Sideroblastic anemia is uh, caused by lead poisoning and by alcohol, overconsumption of alcohol. And it's called sideroblastic anemia because if iron isn't binding to this heme, it will instead just precipitate in the mitochondria and cause sideroblasts. Um, so when you look at it on blood film, you'll see sideroblasts in the red blood cells, and that's why it's called sideroblastic anemia. Very, very cool name. <laughs> um, lead poisoning can be remembered by the acronym LED. So L stands for lead lines. So Burton lines, here you can see a picture of it, these blue lines here. And e stands for encephalopathy, so you'll have the patients will present with personality changes. A stands for abdominal pain. D stands for uh, drop wrist, so you get motor neuropathy. And then S for sideroblastic anemia, so lead poisoning can be remembered by the acronym LEDS. Um, and then you treat lead poisoning by calculating it. So you want to bind the lead in the blood and then it can be excreted. Sideroblastic anemia, it was caused, so I said one of the causes was lead poisoning. And then another cause is alcohol over, like eat, drinking too much alcohol. And the way that alcohol causes sideroblastic anemia is it inhibits this B6 uh, uh, vitamin basically. You get this deficient deficiency in this B6 uh, vitamin. So you treat uh, sideroblastic anemia by giving B6 supplements, basically. Um, iron studies are really important to determine what type of a, a, a microcytic anemia you have. The most, uh, so if you look at these different columns, the first one is serum iron. That I think is makes common sense. That's just how much iron is in the blood. Then ferritin is the protein that binds to iron and stores it. So it's a, a storage protein. Then you have here, I'm, I'm skipping a column, but here transferrin, that's a protein that tr uh, transports um, iron. So it transports iron from um, the storage uh, site. So uh, iron is stored in the liver, in the bone marrow. So transferrin will uh, transport it from the storage sites to the cells that need it. So most cells need iron, so yeah. And then this transfer and saturation is just how much iron is bound to this protein. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so if we go through the first one, iron deficiency, of course you'll have low serum iron because you're not consuming, you're not having enough iron in your diet or you're not absorbing enough the iron. Then ferritin, is the storage form, right? It's the storage protein that stores iron. So if you don't have enough iron to begin with, you can't store it, so you'll have low ferritin. If we skip this one just quickly, transferrin is high, why? Because you're not having enough iron. Uh, the cells don't have enough iron because you're not consuming it enough. So the body tries to transport more iron from the storage sites to the cells that need them. This is a futile effort, however, because um, there's not enough iron to in the storage sites to begin with. But yeah, the protein, the body doesn't know that, so it just increases how much transfer in protein is, is synthesized. And then the saturation, of course, will be low of this transfer in protein because transfer isn't binding to anything. There's not enough iron to bind to. Uh, another important thing to know quickly is that ferritin 
is an acute phase reactant protein. It's a acute phase protein, sorry. So in inflammatory states, it will be raised. Ferritin and transferrin are inversely correlated. So if ferritin is raised, transferrin has to be low. They can't both be high. That's um, important to note. So if, if we take the example of anemia of chronic disease, ferritin is high because chronic disease, inflammation happens, you know, you have an inflammatory state. So ferritin will be elevated. What does that mean? Well, that means transferrin has to be low. Um, and then you don't have enough iron either because you're not absorbing enough in chronic disease. You're losing it, for example, in chronic kidney disease, or you're using too much of it in cancer. It's more complex, but I think this is useful to know that ferritin and transferrin are inversely correlated. You can't both of if one is low, the other one has to be high, etc. cetera. Um, I think I don't have to go through everything for time. Um, so that was microcytic anemias. Macrocytic anemias happen because um, the hemoglobin is fine. There's nothing wrong with hemoglobin. However, the red blood cell itself is, something has happened to it where it's not, um, replicate. It's not working well because it doesn't have essential vitamins uh, like B12 and folate. I'll just focus on those uh, quick first because I think those are the most important. So without B12 and folate, uh, the nucleus of the red blood cell isn't able to produce the proteins, that it, the cell signals that it needs. It, it won't work well. So the red blood cell will be stuck in a it won't mature, basically, it won't become smaller, right? Because we, you, if you remember red blood cells, as they mature, they become smaller and smaller and smaller. So in this case, the red blood cell can't mature. Um, and instead, all of the processes in the cytoplasm still happen. So you're still having organelle replication and all of that, because that doesn't require B12 and folate. So not only is the blood cell not maturing as it should, but all the, uh, all the other components of the red blood cell are becoming larger and larger and larger because more of them are happening as you're stuck in this standstill. Um, so the blood cells will become large and macrocytic. Um, B12 and folate deficiency will cause megaloblastic anemia because if you think about it, if the nucleus of the red blood cell isn't working, then that isn't isolated to the red blood cell. You have so many cells in the body, skin cells, neural cells, all of those nuclei will also be affected you, because they also won't have B12 and folate deficiency. Uh, sorry, they won't have B12 and folate. So um, in neutrophils, B12 and folate deficiency causes hypersegmented nu uh, nuclei because um, they're not maturing either. Um, and this is where these are megaloblastic nuclei, that's why it's called megaloblastic macrocytic, macrocytic anemia. Um, so B12 um, and folate are absorbed in the um, intestines. The way I like to remember this is when you have clothes, first you iron them, then you fold them, and then you put them in the closet. Another name for B12 is cobalamin. So I remember cobalamin here. So clothes, you iron them, then you fold them, then you put them in the closet. So iron is, fo uh, for in uh, is absorbed in the duodenum, folate is absorbed in the jejunum, and the uh, cobalamin or B12 is absorbed in the ileum. B12 deficiency um, is caused by various things like veg veganism <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, malabsorption diseases like celiac disease and Crohn's disease. However, um, pernicious anemia is caused um, by a specific autoantibody against intrinsic factor. Um, it's very long uh, as to why this happens. Basically, intrinsic factor is binds to B12 so that it can be absorbed. Uh, without intrinsic factor, B12 can't be absorbed. And the cells that produce intrinsic factor um, are some gastric cells in the um, some gastric cells, basically. And um, in, if you develop autoantibodies against intrinsic factor, then you can't absorb B12, and that leads to pernicious anemia. An important thing about 
B12 deficiency is that it causes neurological symptoms, um, which presents with glove and stocking neuropathy. Basically, um, the distribution is where the gloves, where gloves are and where stockings are, it starts there. So at the peripheries first and then it travels centrally. And it also presents with subacute degeneration of the cord, uh, which uh, presents with mixed upper motor neuron uh, and lower motor neuron signs, as well as new neuropsychiatric symptoms, sorry. Um, and you treat B12 deficiency by replacing B12, um, quite easy. B12 is different from folate uh, because folate deficiency does not present with neurological symptoms. That's an important thing to remember. And um, also, it's also caused by um, malabsorption diseases like celiac disease, but also change, like diet low, low in, diets low in folate. And something important to uh, note is if you look here in this diagram, folate absorption, when folate is absorbed, it's bound to a methyl group. In order to li liberate folate, B12 has to bind to this uh, methyl group um, so that folate can be liberated and be used for DNA synthesis. If you replace folate without also replacing B12, then B12 will be used up because it's liberating all of this folate and then you can get B12 deficiency because all of the B12 is being used up to liberate the folate. So you also have to replace B12 if you're replacing folate. I hope that made sense. If not, just um, shout out or send a message. Okay. Um, hemolysis is, um, so hemolytic anemia is caused by destruction of red blood cells. Um, so um, hemolysis can happen either inside the vessels, and that's called intravascular hemolysis, or in the reticular reticuloendothelial system, which is basically just the spleen, the liver and the bone marrow, which is involved with like uh, cleaning the blood, basically. So the spleen is classic. It, it will remove any abnormal red blood cells or abnormal cells in general. Um, so yeah, so a destruction of red blood cells can happen inside the blood vessels or in the spleen slash liver slash bone marrow. And we call this extravascular hemolysis. Uh, if it's intravascular hemolysis, then it happens in the blood, blood, so the spleen will be of normal size, of course. Whereas if it's extravascular, then the, all the red blood cells are going to the spleen, so you'll have splenomegaly. Um, the blood film in intravascular hemolysis will show schistocytes because um, most intravascular hemolysis is caused by, for example, um, uh, prosthetic heart valves or uh, narrowed blood vessels. And that will cause physical damage to the red blood cells, and that is schistocytes, uh, sort of damaged red blood cells. That's what schistocytes are. Whereas uh, spherocytes are, um, so an uh, abnormal blood cell in, in elliptocytosis or spherocytosis um, may show on the blood film, so you'll see spherocytes. Um, I'll skip these two for now and just focus on this and I'll come back. So LDH is re released uh, by um, red blood cells because it's an enzyme which is very abundant in red blood cells. So if you break, if you destroy red blood cells, then LDH will be released into the blood. So that will be raised. So um, in extravascular, in, sorry, in intravascular hemolysis, um, you will have the um, breakdown or the destruction of the red blood cell in the blood vessel, right? And um, the hemoglobin that is released from that red blood cell will have three um, fates. It can either be urinated out, so some hemoglobin will be urinated out. Some of it will be um, stored in, um, in tissues as hemosiderin. And then, um, yeah, so those are, that's why it's raised here. Um, and then, yeah, and then some of it is, some of the hemoglobin is actually um, bound to haptoglobin so that it can be destroyed by the spleen. So uh, splenic macrophages will consume some of the hemoglobin released in intravascular hemolysis 
um, but only if it's first bound to haptoglobin. Without binding first to haptoglobin, then it won't travel to the spleen. That's why haptoglobin is reduced in intravascular hemolysis, because it's being bound to the hemoglobin released by the red blood cells, and then it's being uh, eaten up by the splenic macrophages. Um, so red blood cells destroyed in hemolysis will often be uh, defective. Uh, so th that's why they are destroyed in the first place, right? So the body won't just destroy blood cells just because just because it wants to. It normally is because the red blood cells are, are weird in some way. And the main two types of abnormal red blood cells that you have to know about are D6PD deficiency and hereditary spherocytosis. Uh, some of it is just rope learning, but um, what I wanted to highlight is D6PD deficiency. It's, so D6PD is just an enzyme that the red blood cell has that uh, protects against stress, so oxidative stress um, specifically. So without D6PD, then the red cells will become stressed. That's uh, basically it. Um, and this is precipitated by stressors. So um, if you give um, a patient, for example, uh, a new drug, or if the patient develops an infection, then the body becomes stressed and the red blood cells will also become stressed. And because they don't have this enzyme, then uh, they will become hemolyzed, basically. Um, when, uh, when the red blood cells are stressed, then the hemoglobin can become damaged and precipitate inside the red blood cells forming Heinz bodies. So Heinz bodies are just um, hemoglobin particles inside stressed red blood cells. Um, and the spleen will try to will remove some of the Heinz bodies um, and, and form bite cells, which are basically red blood cells where the splenic macrophages have removed the damaged hemoglobin. Um, hereditary spherocytosis is basically just a um, disease where the um, structure of the red blood cells is defective because of a mutation. So instead of being um, the normal shape, then they appear more sphere-like, so almost like a ball. Um, and it's detected by EMA binding test. That's something uh, that comes up a lot in exams. Um, so in sickle cell disease, so uh, the, as you remember, uh, hemoglobin is made up of globin, right, the proteins. Normally it has two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains. However, in sickle cell, there is a mutation to the beta globin and it forms a HBS, which is basically a mutated globin, beta globin. One copy of this mutated beta globin will form, will cause a um, sickle cell trait, uh, whereas two copies of the beta globin will cause um, sickle cell disease. Um, the consequences of this mutation is that the beta globins are uh, more attracted to each other and will cause the red blood cells to collapse because there's such a strong attraction between the beta globins. They just want to stick together so much that the red blood cells appear, they collapse and appear like a sickle. However, this sickle will only happen if the red blood cells are deoxygenated. So if, when the red blood cells are um, carrying oxygen, then they appear normal. Whereas when they uh, don't have oxygen inside them, then they will sickle. The problem with these sickle uh, cells is that um, they accumulate in the capillaries and cause various symptoms, which I'll go into. Um, the diagnosis of sickle cell disease is by doing a full blood count, which will show reticulocytes because the body is trying to compensate. Uh, it's noticing that the patient is anemic and it's not, carry, not, not carrying enough oxygen, so more blood cells are being produced and that will produce um, immature blood cells as well. They will spill over into the blood. Uh, blood film will show um, sickle cell, as you can see here, sickle shaped cells and Howell-Joel bodies, um, which is HGB here. 
um, how Joe bodies are nuclear remnants. So as, as you remember, immature red blood cells have a nucleus. As they mature, they become smaller and smaller and smaller, and also they lose, lose their nucleus. However, uh, more and more um, red blood cells are being made um, to compensate for the anemia, and some of them spill over into the blood. So you see reticulocytes, as I mentioned. Um, and some of them, and you know, these nuclear remnants should be removed. Uh, so these nuclear rem remnants are called a Howell -Joel, Joel bodies. They should be removed by the spleen normally, because sometimes you can have nuclear remnants in red blood cells. However, a lot of sickle cell uh, patients don't have a spleen uh, because of something I'll go into afterwards. So without a spleen, you can't remove these Howell Joel bodies. And so you see them on the blood film. And then the definitive diagnosis is uh, through electrophoresis. Uh, management of um, sickle cell disease is uh, daily folic acid because you want to treat the hemolysis happening. Um, and you also want to give hydroxyurea uh, to increase the concentration of uh, HBF, which is another form of hemoglobin. Um, so sickle cell patients will often not have a spleen. Uh, because of either functional or afunctional uh, aspelenia. Um, normally, spleens are removed uh, because there's a splenic sequestration, for example, of the, abnormals, um, uh, the abnormal red blood cells. And without a spleen, you're at, at risk of encapsulated infections, in including all of these uh, bacteria. Um, so in order to protect sickle cell patients, you have to give them a vaccine that protects against these encapsulated organisms. Um, so as I mentioned, the problem with having sickle cells is that instead of being floppy and normal red blood cells that sort of maneuver around the capillaries and um, do their job, they are like firm, sickled, abnormal red blood cells. And they get trapped in the capillaries and in, it's, they get trapped in, in blood uh, vessels and cause uh, the complications known as sickle cell crises. So um, if they uh, get stuck in uh, the circulation, they can cause infarction, for example, of the mesenteric um, blood supply, splenic supply, uh, they can get, uh, yeah, they can cause um, infarction in the kidneys. Um, if they accumulate in the uh, blood uh, going to the fingers, it can cause dactylitis because um, blood gets stuck in the fingers. Um, they can get stuck in the uh, vasculature going to the lungs and cause pulmonary hypertension, etc. Um, an important thing to note is um, if blood gets stuck somewhere because you have these abnormal cells blocking blood flow, then you have stasis of blood flow and then you can get develop infections. A common infection that uh, happens in sickle cell is salmonella osteomyelitis. That's something that comes up a lot in exams. Um, parvovirus in sickle cell patients is very dangerous because it causes aplastic crises, which is where the bone marrow stops making red blood cells. And um, parvovirus is detected by, you know, this patho pathognomic slap cheek appearance. That's very typical of parvovirus. And because you don't, the blood, the bone marrow isn't making any blood cells anymore, you get low, low blood cells, low reticulocytes, and of course, low hemoglobin. Um, in uh, abnormal red blood cells can also become trapped in the spleen and cause um, splenic sequestration and splenomegaly. Um, and um, if the sickle cells get stuck in the pulmonary vascul vasculature, they can cause acute chest syndrome, uh, which is a leading cause of mortality in patients with sickle cell disease. Um, you diagnose it by finding um, new pulmonary infiltrates on chest x-ray, and the patient will often present with a painful chest prodrome. Um, it's a, so yeah, typical uh, presentation would be sickle cell patient presents with painful chest and on x-ray they have new pulmonary infiltrates um, treatment will often they will often require ventilation um, yeah 
Okay, now we've gone on to, so that's finished with anemias. Now we have to talk about leukemia. So leukemia is a cancer of the white cells, so the white blood cells. There's two types. So uh, I'm going to skip this acute versus chronic first. Let's talk about the two main types. So you have lymphoblastic uh, leukemias. So that affects the lymphoblastic um, precursor. So the, the lymphoblastic precursors will develop into B and T cells. And then myeloblastic leukemias. Um, that's uh, the myeloblast precursor will develop into um, the granulocytes, so the eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, all of that. So those are, um, yeah, and then you can also classify anemia, uh, leukemia, sorry, into acute versus chronic. So um, acute uh, leukemias are when, so all leukemias will have, will are caused by um, cancer basically or yeah a cancer in the blood cells uh, but in the bone marrow specifically so um the there's a mutation somewhere um in the blood cells as them as they're developing in the bone marrow and that cancer will replicate in the bone marrow um, and sometimes those cancer cells will sp spill into the blood so um the malignant cells um are always in the bone marrow, but not always in the blood, if that makes sense. So it's a blood cancer, but um, the cells that are abnormal are found in the bone marrow. Acute uh, leukemias are when the uh, cells that are cancerous are early cells, so they're not mature cells, they're the blasts. Um, uh, versus versus uh, chronic uh, leukemias are the more mature uh, cells, so the neutrophils, all of that, um, they're the ones that become, um, or not neutrophils, but the pro, so the, the steps before becoming, you know, the mature cells, if that makes sense. So acute leukemias occur more early in their differentiation versus chronic um, leukemias develop later in the differentiation of blood cells. Uh, the type of uh, leukemia is you can guess what leukemia the patient has by their age. So ALL will present in uh, children under 14, typically. Um, the myeloblastic leukemias present in middle age, that's how I remember it, um, middle age. So 40 to 60 year olds will present with either AML or CML. It depends on whether the cells are blasts or a bit more mature. So if they're blasts, then it's an acute myelo, and then if they're more mature cells, then it's a chronic. And then CLL will present above the age of 60 normally. So um, if the vignette says a four-year-old, then you'll say ALL most likely. If the clinical vignette is like 40-year-old presents with leukemia, then you can guess, okay, it's probably one of the M's, so a middle age, so either AML or CML. And then uh, if it's older person, so 80 year old presents with uh, leukemia, then it's um, CLL most likely. Of course, this is a generalization, but yeah. So yeah, here's what I mentioned. So um, the, uh, as I mentioned, ALL, you have blasts, right? So more uh, immature cells because they're acute, acute. Um, What's important to remember is with AML, you see hour rods on blood films. If you see hour rods, then you know that it's an AML. And as I mentioned, um, the cells that are abnormal will replicate in the bone marrow and some will spill into the blood and then they can infiltrate um, organs. So they can travel to organs and replicate there. ALL, they will typically replicate in the CNS and the testes, versus AML will typically replicate in the gum and the skin. Uh, this is the treatment for either. Um, something to uh, be aware of is that with chemotherapy, um, the chemotherapy won't cross the uh, blood brain barrier. So you have to give methotrexate if there's uh, CNS involvement. A specific a subtype of AML is called um, promyelocytic uh, leukemia. This PML is caused by a PML-RARA translocation. 
Um, and the treatment is instead of chemotherapy, you just give them ATRA because the um, abnormal cells are replicating because they don't have this ATRA and um, ATRA. So it's a very nice prognosis for these patients. You just give them uh, ATRA and then they get uh, better, which is great. Uh, chronic leukemias are more uh, mature cells, right? Um, so you won't see the blasts on blood film. You'll see more mature um, myeloid precursors. In CLL, importantly, you'll see smudge cells. Um, that's just something you have to remember. Um, not much to say. Um, and um, treatment for CLL, one third of them uh, will not progress to um, um, B cell lymphoma, where uh, one, one third will remain stable and one a third of them will get better. Um, so yeah, CLL can transform into B cell lymphoma and one third of them do transform. Uh, but no, it's, the treatment is just supportive. Uh, CML is caused by this, uh, you know, we've heard this from second year, BCR-able translocation. Um, typical presentation is massive splenomegaly and treatment is with imatinib, so, uh, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. All right. Lymphomas um, are solid tumors of the immune cells. So we talked about leukemias, which I mentioned was uh, the blood, the white cells, uh, abnormal white cells replicate in the bone marrow and spill into the blood. Uh, lymphomas are abnormal cells uh, replicate in the lymph tissues. So when B cells, T cells are finished um, being formed in the bone marrow, they'll travel to the thymus, for example, or to the lymph tissues to get um, educated um, and learn how to detect bacteria and things like that. And if these mature cells uh, become cancerous, then they'll form a lymphoma. Um, so uh, the, there's two types of lymphoma. There's Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, the way I like to remember it is Hodgkin's lymphoma are the is the lymphoma that presents with Reed Sternberg cells. These I think you also remember from second year. And then non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is all the lymphomas that don't have the Reed Sternberg cells. So uh, most lymphomas are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then 10% will have these Reed Sternberg cells. Uh, there's more. Um, ways to classify Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. I guess I would like to just quickly talk about B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. You can either have aggressive uh, non-Hodgkin's, which is caused, uh, which is called a large B-cell lymphoma, or you can have um, not aggressive B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is called follicular lymphoma. Okay. Lymphoma classification, so yeah, as I mentioned, Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. Um, risk group of Hodgkin's lymphoma is bimodal, so you first have a peak at age 16 and then 25. Um, then uh, I think an important symptom to know about Hodgkin's lymphoma is alcohol-induced pain. So um, typically the patient will come in and say, oh, I have a lot of pain after drinking alcohol then you might suspect Hodgkin's lymphoma. And of course, a Hodgkin's lymphoma is Reed Sternberg cells. You classify Hodgkin's lymphoma using Ann Arbor, the Ann Arbor classification, which I'll go into a bit later. Um, and then the treatment is just this combination of um, chemotherapies. And then um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, more sort of, you know, not as specific symptoms, I guess you could say. Um, treatment is with RCHOP, which is another combination of uh, chemotherapies. Um, so yeah, the Hodgkin's lymphoma, you classify using the um, Ann Arbor classification. And uh, so in stage uh, one, there's just a, a single lymph node region, right? In stage two, there's two or more lymph nodes uh, in the same side of the diaphragm. So that's, uh, as you can see here. In stage three, there's two or more lymph nodes. One of them is above the diaphragm and one of them is below the diaphragm. 
And then in stage four, there's a lymph node involvement above and below the diaphragm, but also there is um, involvement of other organs. Um, so multiple myeloma is um, an abnormal proliferation of plasma cells. So plasma cells, as you might remember, are derivatives of B cells, which make the antibodies. And they're classified by um, what type of antibodies um, the plasma cells make. So if it's an IgG, for example, plasma cell, an IgA plasma cell, uh, etc. Um, the symptoms of myeloma can be remembered by the acronym CRAB. So C st stands for hypercalcemia, R for uh, renal insufficiency, A for anemia, and B for bone disease. Um, the um, treatment is just supportive. Uh, you want to treat the complications of the cancer. And uh, management is uh, with chemotherapy. Uh, yeah. Um, an important oncological emergency that I think you should all be aware of because it comes up in exams are um, superior vena cava obstruction, where there's um, superior vena cava, um, the flow of blood is obstructed by a tumor and causes pooling of blood um, by the site in the site strained by the superior vena cava. So as you can see here, this man appears, you know, swollen because there's so much blood accumulated. Um, in the tissues. Um, the, it's an emergency, an oncological emergency that is very important to recognize. Uh, and you have to treat by giving eight milligrams of dexamethasone. That's just uh, something you have to know. Uh, so coagulopathies are disorders of secondary hemostasis. So that's um, secondary hemostasis is how the clot formed in primary hemostasis is sort of uh, like, how, how can I best describe it? So you make the clot in primary hemostasis and then you make sure that the clot doesn't move in secondary hemostasis, if that makes sense. So the fibrin will sort of make a mesh around the clot and make sure that it doesn't move. Disorders of um, hemostasis are um, called different names depending on what factor in the clotting cascade is affected. So in von Willebrand disease, um, you have not enough uh, von Willebrand factor produced, whereas in haemophilia, you don't have enough of uh, clotting factor eight or nine produced. Um, these are important uh, thing, uh, diseases to remember just because they come up in exams a lot. Um, an important thing to also remember is uh, von Willebrand disease. You'll have factors, uh, symptoms of primary hemostasis, uh, disorders of primary hemostasis, as well as um, symptoms of secondary hemostasis, because von Willebrand uh, is used in primary hemostasis and also secondary hemostasis, if that makes sense. So you'll have, uh, you know, the typical symptoms of primary hemostasis defects, so like epistaxis, mucosal bleeding, but also you can have symptoms of secondary hemostasis, like more deep anatomical bleeding or late re-bleeding. Um, yeah. And I think I don't have to go through this um, one by one, but I think it's a good cheat sheet to have when approaching different thrombophilias. Thrombophilias are just um, the patients love to bleed that's how I remember them. So there's something that's stopping them from bleeding. Yeah, I think so. This warfarin therapy is another thing that comes up a lot in exams. Um, you have to just remember how to uh, treat them depending on the INR of the patient. I don't think I have to go through this, just um, learn it basically. And um, yeah. So the warfarin depends on the INR. I think, yeah, this is just guidelines that you have to learn, uh, not much to understand, basically. And then finally, transfusion reactions. So uh, when you give blood, there are two types of uh, transfusion reactions that you can uh, develop. You can have um, immune-related uh, transfusion reactions and non-immune-related. 
Um, Non-immune related are easier because they make more sense. So things like circulatory overload, if you give blood, sometimes you can give too much blood and the patients will present with um, circulatory, so fluid overload. Um, symptoms include a raised JVP, bivasal crackles and stuff like that. And you treat it by slowing the transfusion, giving oxygen and giving a diuretic. Um, then you have um, another non-immune is um, transfusion-related iron overload. So instead of uh, overloading them with fluid, you can overload them with iron. Um, and then you can have um, infective contamination. So you can have a bacteria in the blood, which causes um, an infection in the blood. Um, and then graft versus host disease, uh, which is when the T lymphocytes or T cells from the donor blood um, attack the recipient's body. So the T cells in the blood uh, that is transfused into the patient attack the patient. Um, what's important to know is just how they present um, and then how to uh, treat. So in golf versus host disease, you want to irradiate the blood. So you want to remove any T cells that the blood has um, in vulnerable hosts. So uh, classically, this will be, you know, patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example. And then, so those were the non the non immune. Although, yeah, I, I sorry, I would say grass versus host is an immune uh, disease. But, and then um, the others are immune um, related uh, transfusion reactions. So, I like to remember it by the acronym a fat nurse hemolyzed my lab. A stands for allergy or anaphylaxis. Fat nurse stands for um, um, febrile non hemolytic. So febrile non hemolytic. Nurse stands for um, uh, yeah sorry uh, febrile non and then uh, he my my labs labs is for lung injury or trally. So a fat nurse hemolyzed my labs. So a a anaphylaxis fat nurse febrile non hemolytic hemolyzed my labs labs lung injury trally. Um, Probably not the best acronym, but it's stuck. And then again, uh, just important to recognize what symptoms goes with what. So allergy will present with ur ur urticaria and you treat it with the typical allergy. Uh, so things, so adrenaline, steroids, etc. cetera. Um, febrile non hemolytic you slow down the transfusion and you give paracetamol. Um, and then trally or lung injury, you stop the transfusion and then you treat it as a, an arts pr a picture. Um, yeah, I, we could quickly go through this. Um, we don't have any participants uh, today, but um, so I'll just quickly go through it. So this picture here is bite cells. Uh, as I, I think you might remember how jolly bodies, uh, the splenic macrophages, will bite the abnormal hemoglobin out. Um, sorry, the Heinz bodies, sorry, Heinz bodies. Um, and so you'll have these bite cells. These are the, in B12, folate deficiency, as you remember, the megaloblastic neutrophils, so the megaloblastic macrocytic anemia. Then you have the typical Reed Sternberg cell seen in Hodgkin's lymphoma. The schistocyte, no, sorry, the, yeah, so these are the sickle cells. And then I believe these are hypochromic cells in iron deficiency. So iron deficiency, red blood cells will appear hypochromic because the iron is what gives the blood cells uh, their color. And then, um, I'm so sorry, Martha, but I have to rush because the place I'm at is closing and being kicked out. I didn't know that they're closed now. That's, no, that, that's no worries. Should we uh, just but, skip over the SDAs? Um, yeah, I think so, because there's no one them. here. I, I don't know what we want to do. Yeah, I think yeah, we, can we, can, we can just we can do ID. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, Thank you. cool, no worries. It's all good. Uh, let me close this, stop presenting. All right, I'll share my screen in a second. Um, cool. 
Sorry, guys, just give me a second. All right, can you guys see this? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect, cool. All right. Cool. Damn, okay, that backfired. Whatever, let's do it like this. Okay, guys, I know there are not that many people here, but I want this to be as chill a session as possible. I want you guys, I, I know everyone's super reluctant to like participate, say things, turn the camera on, whatever, it's fine. Um, if you have questions, please just ask them. We're honestly like, we're just a couple months ahead of you guys. So it's absolutely fine. If you have anything you wanna say, just say it and we can go through it in more detail. So let's just go through the key things in ID. First thing is first, we're gonna talk about sepsis. So you've probably come across this before, I hope you have. It's not a condition in itself, it's a syndrome. So a collection of um, different symptoms. So things like fever, breathlessness, tachycardia, hypotension, basically all the signs that suggest that someone is really ill with an infection. And it's not caused in itself by like the infection of the pathogen, but it's actually caused by your immune system. So it's caused by this kind of overwhelming immune response that leads to organ dysfunction, as opposed to like the actual kind of effect of the pathogen, if that makes sense. So when you first see an ill patient outside of ICU, there's a quick scoring system called QSOFA. You kind of just have to remember it. I'm not gonna read off the slide for you, but um, yeah, this is a very common past med question to calculate someone's risk of having sepsis. So you can just, very quickly calculate based on whether or not they're confused, whether they're hypotensive or how fast they're breathing, how likely it is that they have sepsis. And when they do, when you have decided that someone does have sepsis, people will often say like start the sepsis six. And what that means is what's described up here. So give three and take three. The give three, I think is pretty self-explanatory oxygen because the oxygen sats might be dropping fluid challenge. So this is, um, I don't know whether or not you guys have come across this in the ward before, but when someone's blood pressure is too low, we give them fluids just to um, increase that. To go into a little bit of depth here to help you remember that, it's because of the Frank Starling law in your heart, because when you're dehydrated and there's not enough fluid and your heart isn't being stretched, your heart actually doesn't pump as hard. So if you imagine the muscle fibers in your heart are like little springs, if you fill the heart more, it pumps harder. So to increase blood pressure, you just have to increase how much liquid there is actually flowing inside your body, if that makes sense. And then the last one, broad spectrum antibiotics, I think makes pretty logical sense. And with take three, the first thing is lactate. So if you've not come across this before, again, can be a little bit rogue, but I'm sure you'll remember that lactate is one of those byproducts in anaerobic respiration. And so it becomes a really good marker of tissue hypoperfusion. So when your tissue doesn't get enough oxygen, it ends up having to respire anaerobically and therefore produces lactic acid as a byproduct. So when lactate goes up, it just means your body's tissues aren't getting enough oxygen. If that makes sense. Next one, urine output. This is really important because people who are septic or very, very ill are at dramatically increased risk of AKIs or acute kidney injuries. And um, the kind of cutoff for having an AKI is 0 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. That is a crucial number you guys will probably memorize by the time you do your exam because it comes up all the time. So that's another. And then last one, blood cultures. Again, makes perfect sense. You want to culture whatever bacteria is growing in the blood if there is one. 
And um, in terms of risk factors for sepsis, I think this is pretty, again, self-explanatory. Don't have to lose any sleep trying to remember them. Basically, anything that means your immune system might be weakened, whether it be old age or immunosuppression or like you've got HIV or anything that increases your risk of exposure to pathogens. So if you've got an indwelling line or if you've got a catheter permanently or if you use intravenous drugs, those things are going to increase your risk of exposure to um to all these pathogens. One important distinction to make here, because I used to think this, is um, there's a difference between sepsis and bacteremia. So bacteremia means having a bacteria cultured from your blood. And sepsis is completely different from that. Um, sepsis is the state that I've just described, characterized by all these symptoms. You can definitely grow a bacteria from your blood and have a bacteremia, but not be septic and vice versa, if that makes sense. Cool, so let's move on. So now let's quickly go through um, the main groups of bacteria. Hopefully you remember this from second year, but um, with most bacteria, we like to class them into either gram positive or gram negative based on what color they show up on the gram stain. So when we do a gram stain, the stain is called crystal violet, that's purple, and the counter stain is saffronin, which is pink. So gram positive cocci have a very thick peptidoglycan cell wall and it takes up a lot of the crystal violet, so it goes purple. Gram negative don't take up any of the crystal violet, so it's pink from the saffronin. So this is really important to remember. Don't think you've gone away with like not having to know this just because you're done the second year, because they quite frequently will just give you a microscope slide and ask you what, what this person has. So definitely something to bear in mind. And with gram positive cocci, we have two main groups we need to know about. One's the staphylococci, the other is the streptococci. This slides on about the streptococci. Um, cocci just means round shape, so they're shaped like little balls. And strep means they're in strands. Um, we can we can then further categorize these into um, alpha, beta, or gamma he hemolyzers. And basically, this is just categorizing them based on their ability to hemolyze red blood cells. So from this blood agar plate below, you can kind of already tell um, in beta hemolysis, this means complete hemolysis, alpha means partial, and gamma means there's none at all. And um, here we see some of the most common um, species of streptococci. Some of these you will see more often than others. I would say like group A strep, like strep pyogenes, incredibly important really, really terrible thing to get. I mean, most commonly causes strep throat, but you can have some really, really terrible um, complications like necrotizing fasciitis, which we'll talk about later, and scarlet fever and all of that. But um, yeah, just something to remember. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. You guys can look at, look at this later. Next, we're talking about staphylococci. So if you remember, staph means clusters. So it's like it looks like a bunch of grapes because it's literally clusters of purple dots together in the microscope, whereas strep is chains. And um, when it comes to staphylococci, the only thing we really want to know is whether or not it's staphylococcus aureus, because um, staphylococcus aureus is like the only one that's pathogenic and causes loads of infections. So the way we do this is with the coagulase test. And um, so if it's not coagulase positive, it's going to be something else. And um, most commonly, the one you will see is staph epidermidis. Um, as its name suggests, it's found on the skin. And if the question's asking um, an infection that's been in introduced somewhere from the skin, say like from a catheter or say after someone's had like a prosthetic joint replacement or something where basically where germs from the skin might have been introduced and recently, it's more likely to be staph epidermidis. But otherwise, in terms of the staphylococci, you're going to come across staph aureus far more often. So that's that. Let's move on. Gram negative cocci. Um, there are loads of these, but the main ones I'd recommend you remember are right here. And in fact, from here for your exams, the most important one is uh, Neisseria meningitidis. So it causes meningitis, which is, as you probably know, extremely severe infection. The main context in terms of your exams, you need to know this, is if it says 
child comes in with signs of meningitis, they've cultured a gram negative diplococci, you immediately know it's nasary meningitis and you will treat this with IV keftriaxone. Um, those are the key points really when it comes to this. All right, next, antibiotics. I always found antibiotics quite tricky to remember because they all sound very similar. And um, if it, it takes a little time to get your head around them, but I promise you, you'll get there eventually. It just takes a little bit of time. I try to group them based on categories and remember like what bro broadly, what each category, category can treat. And then you can go into the details of like each generation of antibiotics and what each, what each generation is used, is used to treat later. But try to get kind of the broad concepts right first. So penicillins, broadly, they're used for gram positive bacteria. And then opposed to like that would be the aminoglycosides. So that's down here, gentamicin, that's used for gram negatives. These are two key groups of antibiotics. And if you just remember the whole time, like penicillins, gram, neg gram positive, and aminoglycosides, gram negative, that will get you a long way already, just knowing that. So penicillins, a lot of people are penicillin allergic. And whenever someone says that they are pen allergic when you're taking history, always, always ask them, like, what reaction do you get when you take penicillin? Because a lot of people have taken penicillin as a child when they have mono. And um, if they take ampicillin while they have mono, they can get a rash. And this is completely unrelated to the penicillin. This is just a side effect. And it might be that they don't have a reaction at all. So it could still be worth treating them with penicillin, if that makes sense. So always worth asking what happens if you take the drug. So next thing, tazosin. Um, you only need to know this in the context of one thing, and that's neutropenic sepsis. So tazosin is a combination of tazobactam and piperacillin. In terms of past med, in terms of your exams, only things you need to know, used to treat neutropenic sepsis, and it can cause myelosuppression. And that's, that's done for what you need to know. Moving along, keftriaxone. We already mentioned this earlier. It's used to treat meningitis, but... Um, more broadly speaking, it's a third generation keflosporin. I know that's a lot of words. So I would try to think of it as, so when you move down the generation of keflosporins, they get broader and broader spectrum. And basically they get better and better at treating infections. And when you get to the third generation, they're really, really good. They're very broad spectrum and you use them for really severe infections like meningitis and also like things like pyelonephritis. So you really save these for like the big, really bad infections, especially ones caused by gram negative bacteria. All right, tetracyclines. And I'll talk about tetracyclines and ciprofloxacin together because they're both quite similar. They have like, they're all right with gram positives and negatives. They're not really used first line. They can be for things like COPD exacerbation. Um, you could use tetracycline first line, but generally it's not really chosen over other things. Um, where both of these really shine is in their coverage of atypical bacteria. So ciprofloxacin is really fantastic when you want to cover things like pseudomonas. So if the question's saying something like um, the patient's got diabetes or the patient's got cystic fibrosis, instantly your brain should be like, they're at increased risk of having pseudomonas. I want to give them ciprofloxacin on top of anything else I want to give them because they could be infected with that. Um, and it's kind of the same with tetracyclines. Um, other than that, tetracyclines are generally used first line for like STIs, so things like chlamydia, but you guys don't need to know that yet. So yeah, we'll just leave that at that. Gentamicin, I've already been on about before, gram negatives. Um, yeah, it, it's nephrotoxic and autotoxic. That's a past med favorite. You'll eventually, it, it'll just become, I don't know, ingrained in your system that that's what it does. But I know it's a lot of words for now. And um, the other two you won't come across too often. Linezolid is useful when it's like a, it's your last line of defense when nothing else works. Um, especially with things like MRSA, with things like vancomycin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, like things that are really difficult to treat. 
they will probably still be susceptible to linezolid. So that's when you whip out the big guns and that's what you give them. And antifolates, again, not going to lie, relative to everything else, a little bit irrelevant. <laughs> like you use them to treat UTIs. That's the, that's the main time you will come across them. But I think it's unlikely that they'll ask you about the side effects, but it's still worth remembering. So moving on to what's next here is TB. Hopefully at this point in your medical careers, you've come across TB at some point or another. But um, if you haven't, then tuberculosis is caused by mycoplasma tuberculosis. It generally affects the lungs. Most people have no symptoms and it's latent. And actually um, a quarter of the world's population have TB. So a lot of people have it. And um, only 10% of latent TB becomes active. So most people kind of lead their lives not really knowing that they have it. They just go about, you know, having TB, living their lives. Um, not really worrying about it ever. But in some of these people, it then becomes active and it can sometimes be like a particular thing that's triggered this. It can be like they've acquired HIV. It can be they've started immunosuppressive drugs. It can be, um, I don't know, acquiring another illness that's weakened their immune system. But when it becomes active TB, this is when we really have to start worrying about it. And um, in terms of your exams and what's relevant for you to know, if you see a chest X-ray, TB is most likely to affect the upper lobes. And um, it generally presents like this. This is called a GON complex. So um, to go a little bit nerdy on you guys, um, what happens with TB is when it first enters uh, your lungs, it gets, you know, phagocytosed by a macrophage and it actually doesn't get digested. It's It stops the vesicle from fusing with the lysosome. So it, it just survives and it can keep surviving. It creates this little localized infection. And then it gets like surrounded by all these immune cells and forms this granuloma. And that's what this gone complex is. That's what this little circle in this up, um, X-ray up here is. And um, that's how you identify someone with TB if you get asked to do that. And um, in a very small proportion, again, of people who develop active TB, this spreads beyond the lungs. And then it's called extrapulmonary TB. Most commonly, it spreads to lymph nodes close to the lungs, so cervical and supraclavicular. But it can also spread literally anywhere in your body. It can spread to your brain. It can spread to your urogenital system. It can, it can literally go anywhere. And sometimes it goes out, then comes back into the lungs. And... Um, this is especially seen in what's called miliary TB. It's called that because it looks like millet seeds. And it's this X-ray uh, below here, if I move that. So I, you guys probably can't see it super clearly, but if you look it up online, it's just tiny, tiny little dots all over the place, like millet seeds. And um, when you see that on the X-ray, it's a really bad sign. The prognosis is quite bad. Um, it's gonna be widely disseminated throughout the body in these tiny, tiny little lesions and it can cause very non-specific signs, so it takes a while to diagnose as well. Um, I'm not going to read this out. You can see here what is required for a diagnosis of active TB. But um, just another thing to reiterate, if there's one thing you take away from this slide, it's that TB can affect anywhere in your body. It's not just the lungs. It's not just going to be your patient who's lost weight and is coughing up blood and has just been to like South Africa or whatever it can affect anywhere and it can look like anything. Um, last year, one of the ID consultants said to us, like, if you're not sure what infection the patient has, and it's clearly something that's infective, when you list your, like, your differentials out for the consultant, at the end of them, just tag along, TB, syphilis. You're never going to be wrong because TB and syphilis can imitate almost anything else. So, you know what? Who knows? Just, just you know, slip the TB test in and see if maybe they have it as well. Cool. So next, let's talk a bit about how you treat TB. Hopefully you remember this from second year again. It's these four drugs, RIPE, Rifampicin, Isoniazid, Pyrazinamide, Ethambutyl. And um, the side effects, this, unfortunately, you do have to know all of them. Um, it's how I try to remember it is rifampicin. Rifampicin turns your pee and your tears red. It, once you see it, you will never forget it. It is very distinct, bright red, orange. 
and um, it can be scary for patients unless you well you have to tell them beforehand. Isoniazid it gives you peripheral neuropathy because it makes patients deficient in vitamin B6. Patients will describe it as feeling like they're walking on clouds. Um, yeah, that's just something uh, you have to bear in mind. And then pyrazinamide, um, this can flare gout, but honestly, they don't really ask as many questions about this as they do the other ones. And ethambutyl causes optic neuritis. So always before you start someone on TB treatment, you want to check their eyesight before and after. And also, almost all of them affect your liver. So how I think about it is just, you have to check your liver, you have to check your eyesight, and you have to check your kidneys. And I think if you, if you, if you just think about like how drugs are generally cleared from your body, you'll probably come to a conclusion that you'll have to check your liver and kidneys anyway. <laughs> so hopefully this, I don't know, again, gets ingrained in your system at some point. Um, you might have seen on the slide earlier that a lot of them are either P4, P450 inducers or inhibitors. These are, again, exam question favorites. Um, you can come up with whatever, whatever works for you to remember them, but I would highly recommend at some point just sitting down and remembering it because it will save a lot of pain <laughs> when it does come up because it does frequently come up. Um, I don't actually use these um, mnemonics. I have my own, but what, whatever works for you, whatever is memorable for you, I would recommend you just sitting down and committing it to memory. Cool. Gastroenteritis, another big topic. Um, I, I know this is a lot of words on the slide. I try to split it into how these pathogens actually cause the gastroenteritis. So I split it into three categories. The first is mucosal invasion. So the bacteria actually like invades the lining of your intestines or the production of an enterotoxin or the production of an exotoxin. So let's talk about this step by step because I know that can be overwhelming. First, exotoxin. What I mean by that is this is a peptide that's secreted by the pathogen and it's already secreted when it's in the food. It, this exotoxin is sitting there in the food in your fridge and the moment you eat it, it's already going to take effect. It doesn't matter if you've heated it up in the microwave. It doesn't matter if you've killed the bacteria, the toxin is still there. So it kind of makes sense that these are going to act the quickest. And the two that do that are Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus. Classically, the past mid question for Bac Bacillus cereus is you've got a fried rice that you've left out on the counter for like a day and a half and you eat it. It's always associated with rice in the exams, like always. You see rice, you put bacillus cereus. If it's not rice and someone's vomiting like an hour or two after eating food, then it's probably staph aureus. That is the quick guide to these two pathogens causing gastroenteritis. And then moving on, you have your enterotoxins. So kind of in the name, these affect your gut. So just thinking logically about how long it takes for food to get to your gut and for these pathogens to produce this enterotoxin that, you know, to take effect, all of this is going to take longer than the exotoxin. So with, with Staph aureus and Bacillus cereus, we're talking about one to six hours after eating, you're going to already be feeling it. With the enterotoxins, we're talking about E. coli, uh, cholera, these take a little bit longer. It takes around 12 hours, 48 hours. And um, generally, they cause watery diarrhea and um, extremely, extremely common. If the question involves, say, someone's recently gone to travel, they come back and it's like a day later, they've got really watery poo. It's probably E. coli, unless they've made it really obvious that they've been somewhere where there's cholera, then it's probably E. coli. And last of all, we've got mucosal invasion. So the reason why I like to remember it in terms of these three ways is because with mucosal invasion, these are the pathogens that generally cause bloody diarrhea. And it makes the most sense because they're actually invading your mucosal lining. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about things like Campylobacter, Shigella. Um, yeah, 
mainly those two and salmonella actually but salmonella doesn't cause bloody poo uh, it's only campylobacter and shigella and with all of these like nine times out of ten you can treat it with ciprofloxacin people bring ciprofloxacin with them to prevent traveler's diarrhea and um except for rare cases so campylobacter you would treat with something else and cholera you treat with something else um but otherwise almost always you'd treat it with cipro uh last of all we have these two down here which are kind of dark horses they don't really like to ask about them but it's just good to know um they're not bacteria they're parasites or like just amoebas um and they are much more chronic so when the onset is over seven days and it it's not as acute in its presentation then you're starting to think <clears throat> maybe it's giardia or maybe it's amoeba and um with a uh, giardia there's no blood with amoebas there is blood so someone comes with like a bloody diarrhea that takes over seven days to come about then you're thinking you're starting to think about these but otherwise it's the kind of top half of this table that I'd be worried about. If anyone has questions, please, please feel free to just like butt in. I do not mind at all. I would much prefer you guys, you know, say something or ask whatever um, you have questions about. Um, cool. So next we're going to talk about necrotizing fasciitis. Um, this is an incredibly, incredibly scary thing. The onset is terrifyingly rapid and um, being able to recognize when this is happening in an a and &E or in GB or wherever you end up in your future career can genuinely save someone's life. And um, I used to think it was a really rare thing, but actually it really isn't. It happens more than you think, which is a scary thought, but yeah, it happens more than you think. Um, so this is kind of famous as like flesh eating bacteria or whatever, but um, there are two types. The first type is um, mixed anaerobes and aerobes. So it co it's caused by a mix of different pathogens. And um, as it says on the slide, often occurs post-surgery in diabetics. So diabetics, big risk factor for any of this stuff really. And second type is group A strep. So we talked about this earlier, strep pyogenes classically causing a strep throat, but it's it is absolutely horrible. Um, so not to go off topic too much, but last year I actually saw a lady who had this and she went to the GP with strep throat. So she had a sore throat and she had cuts on her elbows and GP sent her to a &E, and within 48 hours, she literally had one arm amputated and the other arm was like completely debrided. There was barely anything left. And this was considered like super medical success story. They caught it super early, acted super early or else she could have died. And that that's terrifying. So super important to remember. You have to catch it quickly. Urgent debridement, urgent hemodynamic stabilization. And um, yeah, basically, whenever you see someone with cellulitis, always kind of think in your mind, could there be any chance this is actually necrotizing fasciitis? And the main way you tell the difference is that this progresses much more rapidly. The pain is far out of proportion to what you might expect from a cellulitis. And they're going to deteriorate systemically very, very fast. So they're going to have all those signs of sepsis that we talked about earlier. And um, it will get much worse very quickly. So, yeah, that's that. Cool. Um, moving on to more of the things that will come up frequently in your exams, pneumonia. So with pneumonia, we have the organisms that are, we call them typicals, and then your atypical pneumonias. Um, you see these far more commonly, obviously from the name Streptococcus pneumoniae is the most, um, most common cause. With all of these, by the way, for your exams, I know to learn all of them in depth can be quite a big ask, but for the purposes of your exams, I would recommend just getting them into your head as distinct categories with a couple key words that distinguish each of them first. Um, strep pneumo, most common, they don't actually ask about it that much because it's it's kind of basic, but um, the key word would be rust colored sputum. 
And um, if anyone comes in with kind of respiratory symptoms, you can always offer like a urinary antigen test to see if this is what they've got. So next, Haemophilus. This is most typically seen in the context of COPD or bronchiectasis patients. So um, if someone's got pneumonia or if someone's got a COPD exacerbation and, you know, they've got either one of those conditions, it's probably going to be Haemophilus. Um, with Staph aureus, it says down here already, but I'm going to say it again. With pneumonias, if it says they've got a cavitating lesion, it's either going to be Staph aureus or it's going to be Klebsiella. It's one or the other. And if it's someone that's healthy and someone who's had flu before developing this pneumonia, it's going to be Staph aureus. And um, I mean, there's so many things that cause pneumonia. Your exam question is going to be like a quintessential picture. They're not going to make it difficult for you. They're going to say it's like a 24 year old who recently had the flu and now has a cavitating pneumonia. That's going to be Staph aureus. Um, Maraxella, I'm not going to worry about this too much. Again, it's a common cause of COPD exacerbation, but it's not something that comes up very com commonly. So I would I would brush past that. Um, with your atypicals, they love asking about this far more than it actually comes up in real life. But um, a couple key things to distinguish them in your head for you. Again, um, first one's Legionella. This is associated famously with poor air conditioning systems, and they're going to make this glaringly obvious in your exam. They're going to say, this man has just been to Spain and stayed in a really crappy hotel, and it's got really old air conditioning systems, and now he comes back and he's got a dry cough and he's really short of breath. They've got Legionella, in your exam at least, they've got Legionella. And um, the other key thing that I like to remember about it is that it causes hyponatremia, so low sodium. And um, usually those two things just by itself is enough in an exam setting for you to know that, you know, this is Legionella, basically. Um, mycoplasma pneumonia. This, again, is one of the common causes of pneumonia in young people. The key word here would be erythema multiforme. So these are your target lesions. Um, you might know them in the context of Lyme disease. It's kind of hard to explain them without a photo, but it looks like a bull's eye. So if you imagine like a red patch surrounded by a circle that's like not swollen and then another red circle. So literally looks like a target. And um, if they give you one of those photos and say they have like this person has pneumonia, then it's going to be a mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, and then last but not least, chlamydia uh, pistachi. This is a passive favorite. This will always be someone who has a pet bird. And immediately, if they say the person's got a pet bird, you're thinking the bird has got to go. So <laughs> that that's that. You only need to know about the bird, really. And um, Klebsiella, I talked about this before in the context of cavitating pneumonias along with Staph aureus. But um, the key thing that distinguishes Klebsiella pneumonias is that you see it mainly in alcoholics and you get a really distinct red currant jelly sputum. So if you see those things in your question stem, it's going to be Klebsiella. And Klebsiella is quite bad if you get it. It's got quite high risk of because of all these cavitating lesions. Um, you've got high risk of developing like empyema and um, further complications. So not a fun one to have. OK. Niche diseases. I'm not going to spend too much time um, lingering over these. They're not going to be super high yield, but just like the atypical pneumonias, there are key words that you can remember to help you like kind of just have a name associated with it. Um, leptospirosis, as it says here, spread with rat urine. If in the question stem it says they work in a sewer, you're, you, you should be thinking leptospirosis. And it also, if it says in the question stem, they work in a farm that's like infested with mice. Again, think about leptospirosis. But otherwise, it, it doesn't come up super often and especially not in real life. Um, schistosomiasis, again, not one that comes up often. Um, I actually know someone who got this. They went whitewater rafting in Zambia. So if your question stem says someone's been whitewater rafting in Zambia, maybe they've got schistosoma. But again, doesn't really come up often. Uh, 
I'll leave you guys to read about the other two. I'm really not too concerned. With ID, there's so many different conditions. You could spend ages reading about all these niche things. But realistically, the key things are like pneumonia, gastroenteritis, knowing what antibiotics treat what. So like when you come across an infection and someone says, look, it's been caused by Staph aureus in your head, you're thinking, okay, it's probably going to be treated by penicillin. And then if you go one step further, you will know that the penicillin you would choose is probably flucloxacillin. But, you know, that comes with time. But yeah, cool. So this is the an ID cheat sheet, apparently. Um, this is a lot of a lot of words on this slide. I, I'm taking it in as well. I think the key thing, if like for me, you know, teaching you guys right now, the key thing about ID to remember is um, when you're on the wards clocking an a ID patient, a lot of information that you think was irrelevant suddenly becomes a lot more relevant than you know you would have thought. So things like what job do they do? Do they work in a sewer? Do they have a pet bird? What places do they like to go to? You know, do they swim in cholera infested waters regularly? <laughs> you know, who who are they having sex with? What kind of sex do they have? Do they use protection? Like, have they been vaccinated? Where did they grow up? Do did they give like their really sick nephew a hug recently? Like stuff like that. They all become really relevant and patients don't really tell you this stuff unless you deliberately go out of your way to ask them. And um, a lot of the time patients don't like telling people that they have HIV unless you deliberately go and ask, you know. So, um, yeah, just remember to do these things, basically. That would be one of the key takeaways in terms of this talk and, you know, going on to the wards in the future. But um, we've got loads of time, so. I'll go through the SBAs. I don't know how keen you guys are to participate, but um, we'll go through these anyway. Wait, let's have a look. I don't know how many of you guys are still here. Uh, yeah, whatever. Let's go through them anyway. All right. So someone's been treated with C. diff, and this is after a course of clindamycin. So this patient's now turned bright red and and is feeling really nauseous and his heart rate's increased. Does anyone know why this might be the case? Okay, you know what? Let's just talk through this. <laughs> okay, so there are a couple things to take in here, right? First thing is we've not covered C. diff, but this is one of the really crucial um, infections that you'll have to learn about. Super relevant, especially in a hospital setting. Um, the most common hospital acquired, inf acquired infection, and um, especially after someone's just had a course of antibiotics, because antibiotics, as you know, kill bacteria, but there are loads of bacteria that are actually good for us. You know, we have our whole microbiota, and when, you know, all our microbiota has been killed off, there, there's nothing to compete with the pathogens anymore. So it makes us far more susceptible to a lot of other infections. And one of the ones that likes to jump in and take the place of our microbiota is C. diff. So first thing, C. diff, higher risk after course of antibiotics. Second thing to know is, I don't expect you guys to know this, but what you would actually treat a C. diff infection with, and that's oral vancomycin. Vancomycin, you normally give IV. You don't really absorb it very well in your GI tract, but C. diff is a GI tract infection. So you don't need it to be absorbed in your GI tract at all because that's what you're trying to treat. So you give it orally. It's really like the only time you would give vancomycin orally. So this person has got this reaction to vancomycin and this is called red man syndrome. It's kind of in the name. It's um, a little bit like an allergic reaction, but it's not an anaphylaxis. The key way to distinguish red man syndrome from anaphylaxis is this guy is not, you know, struggling to breathe and it's not a life threatening situation. What, what you would do in this situation is you would stop treatment, you would give antihistamine and you'd consider giving a different antibiotic. This is not a frequent, but I guess it occurs on occasion and comes up in your exams. Uh, side effect of vancomycin. So just something to bear in mind. Next question. Um, we've gone through this before, so hopefully you guys will be thinking in your heads 
um, what the answer is, but it doesn't matter if you're not. A uh, 12 year old girl with cystic fibrosis has got a cough and a high fever, which hasn't responded to amoxicillin and salbutamol. So which antibiotic do we think would be given? In this case, we already know it's not responded to amoxicillin. So our usual culprits for what could be causing this is already kind of out of the picture. And um, we talked earlier about people who are at higher risk of atypical infections and people with cystic fibrosis are high up on the list. So we'd be wanting to give her some ciprofloxacin because she's at a much higher risk of pseudomonas infection. All these other ones down here also work, but as I understand it, you kind of save these for like later down the line when things take a turn for the worse. They're they're like the big guns that you bring out a bit later, I would say. Um, but yeah. All right. This 38-year-old Bangladeshi woman with a um, history of cough and fever. She's got a sputum sample that was sent last week and it's come back with significant growth and she's due to be started on anti-TB therapy. What screening tests do we want to do prior to starting the medication? B. Yeah, look at you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, dude, how many people are still on this call? Two more. Oh, that's chill. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, sick. You got it right. Look at you go. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, basically all of them affect your liver. Perizinamide affects your kidney. Ethanbutyl affects your vision. So yeah, sick. Nice. Cool. Um, I will let you read this. Let's see. I've not read this either. OK, so this guy sounds like he's got a pneumonia. Do, do, you, do you know what score you use in pneumonia to like kind of rank how severe it is before you do anything else? Okay, I guess not. Whatever. <laughs> okay, it's curve 65. Um, or C if you haven't got blood test results, it would be C R B 65. So first one is C for confusion. Is this guy confused? Um does it say? Um, he remains alert, so he's not confused. R respirate. Respirate, the cutoff is 30, it's over 30, so that gives him one point. And then um, B is blood pressure, so his diastolic is a little bit low. That gives him another point. That's two points. And then 65 is age, so he's 75. So that's three points. Three points is pretty bad. We'd be wanting to admit him into the hospital for IV antibiotics. And um, then you can basically cross off everything that's not IV, and then you only have C and E. Then it becomes just a thing of like knowing what the right dose for the thing is, and the right dose is C. So that's that. Cool. All right. Um, cool. So this 55 year old has diabetes type two and she's an alcoholic. Very important information. Uh, she's not lost weight. She's not got hemoptysis. She was born in England, never traveled outside England. She doesn't smoke and she's got a cavitating lesion in her right upper lobe. Let's work through the list, right? She's not lost weight or coughing up blood. She's not traveled outside the UK. TB is not really looking like what it's gonna be. Lung cancer, also not really looking like it. She's never smoked. She's not lost weight or not coughing up blood. Not really sounding like it. Pneumococcal pneumonia, maybe, but like pneumococcal pneumonia doesn't cause cavitating lesions. So only one left and like, it should be obvious by the time you've done enough past med to know is Klebsiella because the key things are she's an alcoholic and it's a cavitating lesion and that's the only one that fits the criteria. So yeah, and 